This Parsha podcast is dedicated by David Steppen in loving memory of his parents, Barbara and Harvey. May their souls be elevated in heaven. Of course, we thank you for support of the Parsha podcast coming to you from the Torch Center in Houston, Texas. This week is Parshas Bishalach. And before we dig into this amazing Parsha, let us read this week's five-star review, which comes courtesy of Lone Yan or Yan Seven. And the five-star review reads as follows: Rabbi Walby has been instrumental in reintroducing me to the beauty of Torah and the weekly Parshas. I look forward to his wonderful and exquisite insights each week, and anticipate his weekly newsletter each Friday. Rabbi Walby extracts wisdom and delivers it to your ears and heart with masterful ability. I have learned so much and cannot be more thankful. Chazak ve'amatz, followed by four exclamation points. And we thank Lone Yan 7 for his kind words and his five-star review on Apple Podcasts. And by the way, a new feature is now available to our listeners on Spotify. Apparently, you can now submit five-star reviews on Spotify as well. And please do that, if you can, to support the Parsha podcast and spread the word. Why should we have all the fun here ourselves? Maybe there are other people out there who want to enjoy it as well. Five-star review and let other people know about the Parsha podcast. This week, we have an absolutely loaded Parsha. So many interesting twists and turns in the story. The nation is finally leaving from Egypt. We had the miracles. We had the wonders. We had the signs. We had the templates. And the nation is out. After the death of the firstborn, Pharaoh sends him packing last week's Parsha. And our Parsha begins that we're out. We've left. But right away, we circle back. And we apparently make a move or a pump fake to return to Egypt. We're trying to goad Pharaoh into pursuing them. And God hardens Pharaoh's heart. And Pharaoh marshals his people. And he gets 600 prime chariots. And they go pursue and hunt down the nation. And we have this last final show down at the sea. And the nation seizes the craft of their forefathers and they cry out to God and the sea splits and it comes crashing down upon the Egyptians and the nation erupts in song. This is the first of three songs of the Torah. The men sing, the women sing, there is musical accompaniment and then boom. Right afterwards, there is a tremendous test. Three days without water in the desert and their throats are parched and the people are on the verge of collapsing. And then we have the episode of Mara. They arrive in the city of Mara, and there is water there, but the waters are bitter. And they complain to Moshe. Vayilonu ha'amal Moshe. And the nation complains to Moshe, what are we going to drink? Now, incidentally, this is like a testament to the righteousness. You know, you put us in the desert with that water. After five minutes, everyone is complaining. And here for three days, there were silent. They said nothing. They complained, not a bit. And finally, they get the water, but the water is bitter, and that triggers them, and they complain. But they lasted three days. And God shows Moshe a stick, and he throws it into the water, and the water is sweetened. In last year's Parsha podcast, we said cheekily, sometimes when you have something that's really bitter, but you stick to it, then things sweeten. In Mara, they received a down payment of the laws of the Torah. Sham, sam, lo, choku, mishpah, v'sam, v'sham, niso. There they received several sections of the Torah. Rashi tells us they got the laws of Shabbos and Paraduma, the red heifer, and Dinim, the general jurisprudence, general laws of monetary and civil matters. In Mara as well, Moshe conveys a promise to the Jewish people. This is 15. 26, if you listen to the voice of Hashem your God, and you do what's proper and what's straight and what's upright in His eyes, and you hearken to His mitzvos, and you observe and guard fastidiously all of His statutes, all the maladies that I placed upon Egypt, lo I will not place upon you, ki ani Hashem for I am Hashem, I am the Lord, 
your God. This is a very specific blessing that you won't have any of the maladies of Egypt. Now, the Ibn Ezra, one of the great commentators of the Torah, has a very interesting idea. He says that what happened in Mara was an exact opposite of what happened at the first of the ten plagues. The first of the ten plagues, the sweet waters were turned into blood. They were made undrinkable. Here, we have the opposite. Undrinkable bitter waters is made sweet. And this is God signaling to Jewish people that I will do exactly the opposite of what I did to Egypt. In Egypt, I took their good stuff, made it bad, and I'm your doctor. I'm going to take all your problems, and I'm going to make them good. And the Parsha continues with challenge after challenge, upheaval after upheaval, where the nation is settling in to their life now in the wilderness. They run out of matzah, and they get the manna, and they get the quail, and they learn about faith. You only have food for today. For tomorrow, you have to rely on God. And they learn about Shabbos. You don't go collect it on Shabbos. You get a double portion on Friday. And then we have the two malcontents, Dathan and Abiram, and they violate the prohibition and they keep the leftovers. And then some manna is placed in a vial. Put in a vial to remember for eternity that the Almighty provides sustenance to those that he loves. Chapter 17 tells us about the arrival in the wilderness of sin. And that's the name of the city, not the English word for transgression. They arrive in the wilderness of sin, and guess what? Again, there's no water to drink. And Moshe is told to strike a rock, this time correctly, and it emits water for the whole nation. That rock, that stone, became a well that accompanied them for the next 40 years until the death of Miriam. When Miriam passes, the well dries up. And again, Moshe hits the rock. This time, he should have spoken to it, and he was punished as a result of striking it by being disallowed to enter the land. And finally, the Parsha is capped off by the war with Amalek. Amalek, the grandson of Esav, the nation that is the arch nemesis of our people, they launch an unprovoked attack against the Israelites, and Moshe nominates Joshua, to wage war against Amalek tomorrow. Vayomer Moshe el Yehoshua. Moshe said to Joshua, to Yehoshua, Bechar lanu anashim, go select some men and go make war with Amalek tomorrow. I'm going to go on top of the mountain. I'll have Aaron on my right side. I'll have Hur on my left side. I'll lift up my hands. I'll engage in the war on the higher spheres. And you, with the men that you nominate, you engage in the physical conflict and go contend with Amalek. Moshe ascends the mountain. He's flanked by Aaron and his nephew Hur and lift his hands up. And when his hands are up, the Jews are winning. And when they lapse, we falter. And indeed, Joshua is successful in weakening Amalek. And the Parsha ends with an instruction to never yield in this battle. God says to Moshe, write this as a membrance in a book and place it in the ears of Joshua that I will surely eradicate the memory of Amalek from underneath the sky, from underneath the heaven. In the final verse of the Parsha, Vayomer, and he said, for the hand is on the throne of God. God's making a promise, so to speak, that he will engage in a war of God against Amalek from generation to generation. Rashi tells us that the throne of God is not complete so long as the nation of Amalek is still around. The nation of Amalek represents a challenge, a mutiny against God, and so long as they are present, the throne of God, so to speak, is incomplete. That is the conclusion of the parasha, and of course, it's it's a roller coaster. It goes from one thing to another thing in rapid fire succession. And in this week's parasha podcast, I want to share a theme that I think appears all over the parsha. It's an idea that I think reveals how to avoid the most common blind spot in any grand pursuit of change. Now, in the parsha podcast, you know this. Change is a subject that we're obsessed with because it is why we exist. Our human listeners, and I know some of y'all like to listen with your pets, 
But the humans, we're the unique species in that we have the capacity to have moral change. That's why we have Torah. Torah is the tool to use to become better people. That's why we have the Yetzirah, the evil inclination. That provides tests. And it also provides the opportunity to become terrible, awful people. And that's why humanity is so diverse. Because we can choose for the better and for the worse. And there is a distribution of righteousness amongst the nation. You have some people that are very righteous and others are very wicked. And the Torah, of course, encourages us to change for the better. It's the prescription to take a flawed human and turn this human into an angel. And this Parsha, really the whole book so far, maybe the whole book of Exodus, maybe the whole Torah, is about change. The nation is changing drastically. There is stark change happening to our people. Just a few parishes ago, they were helpless, pitiful slaves. Moshe comes and says, I have a solution. We're going to save you. And they couldn't even hear what he had to say due to shortness of breath and harsh labor. And where are they now? Now they're on the fast track to Sinai. They're going to become the chosen nation, the people of God, about to get the Torah. This is the sharpest and starkest transformation of any people in all of history. And when we see a theme that repeats itself over and over again in the story of change of the Jewish people, it should grab our attention and we should start taking copious notes to figure out what is actually happening over here. So let's begin with a basic question. Where do you start? You start at the very first verse of the Parsha. It was when Pharaoh sent the nation. And then it tells us the route that they took. And God did not lead them through the land of the Philistines because it was so close. If you look at a map and you map out, you know, the modern state of Israel doesn't have the exact same dimensions and borders as the biblical state of Israel, but it's the same general region. And you look at Egypt, and you try to figure out, you know, what is the shortest route, a straight line between these two, it would go through the land of the ancient Philistines. No relation with the modern Palestinians. Absolutely different people. But God says, I'm not going to lead you through the land of the Philistines because that's close. That makes sense. We would say, well, you know, which which path should you take? The closer one. God says, no, we're not going to do it like that. Why? Because God said, maybe the nation will have a change in heart when they see war and they're going to go and want to return to Egypt. So the very beginning of our parsha, it's kind of a, a strange, perplexing idea. God led them on a circuitous route because of the concern that they're going to want to go back to Egypt. Now, this is a shocking thing. Last week, we talked about how 80% of the Jewish people didn't want to leave. And only 20% actually merited to participate in the Exodus. And the people that are around today, Parshas Bashalach, these are the 20%. These are the 20% who want to leave. Nevertheless, there is a concern that maybe they're going to regret their decision when they see some adversity, and they're going to seek refuge back in Pharaoh's warm embrace. Don't make it easy for them to go back home. Don't go through the land of the Philistines. Let's complicate matters a little bit. It's kind of an interesting idea. It's an interesting way to start the Parsha. Now, the solution of where, in fact, to go, how to approach this journey, it seems to be a bit contradictory. God's concerned. Maybe they're going to want to go back to Egypt. And therefore, he wants to make it hard to reunite with the Egyptians. Let's not make it easy for these two to meet. And then a few verses later, this is chapter 14, verse 2, 3, 4. God tells Moshe, go tell the Jewish people to turn back, to circle back, to make it appear that you are confused 
And that's going to prompt Pharaoh to want to pursue you, to chase you. And I'm going to stiffen Pharaoh's heart, and he's going to chase after you. And then we're going to have another revelation of God's might and power over Egypt. So I don't get it. Which is it? Do we want distance between the Israelites who are fleeing from Pharaoh and the Egyptians? Because otherwise, maybe they'll want to go back home if they see some adversity. Or do we want proximity between the two? Let's bring the Egyptians to them. What are the considerations here at play? And in general, we're about to have a sequel to the Exodus. The Midrash tells us, an amazing idea, that Abraham was tested with ten tests. And corresponding to Abraham's ten tests were the ten miracles that God did for Abraham's children in Egypt. And corresponding to that were the ten plagues that God unleashed upon the Egyptians in Egypt. And corresponding to that were the ten miracles that God did for the Jewish people at the sea. And corresponding to that were the ten plagues that God brought about upon the Egyptians at the sea. If you tally up the plagues and the miracles in this Midrash, there were 20 plagues against the Egyptians, 10 in Egypt and 10 at the sea, and there were 20 miracles for the Jewish people, 10 in Egypt and 10 at the sea. In Egypt, we had 10 miracles for the Jews and 10 plagues for the Egyptians. And guess what? We're bringing the crew back together for a second hurrah. Get ready for 10 miracles and 10 plagues at the Sea of Reeds. Why do we need to do this again? Why are we going to run it back? Don't you know that sequels always ruin great masterpieces? We had the drama. We had the miracles. We had the plagues. And we had a permanent separation of these two people that was done already in Egypt. It's done. Goodbye. The pleasure was not mine. I always like to think about how you would forecast the events if you didn't know the content of this week's parsha. Suppose all you had read was up to last week's parsha, you would assume that the Israelites, they moved on to their next objective, go to Sinai, go to the land of milk and honey. Why is there a need for an encore? Why is there a need to bring the Egyptians back and to, to goad them and to harden their heart? Why is there a need for all of that? This is already done for. We've moved on to the next conflict, to the next challenge, but apparently not. And again, this is all manipulated by God. Make it look like you're confused. You're trapped. Let's harden Pharaoh's heart. Why is there a need for an Exodus 2.0? I'm going to suggest an idea here. Let's begin with an analogy. There's an amazing teaching in the Talmud, in the book of Kedushan, page 40a. Some really deep psychology here. Amar Rav Huna. Rav Huna said, Once a person transgresses, violates a commandment of God, and then they repeat it, it becomes as if it is permitted to that person. The Torah tells us all the things that we cannot do because God says he can't do it. It's a transgression against the will of God. It's a violation of the will of God. But what if someone does it? Says Rav Huna, the Talmud, Kiddushin, 40a, on the bottom. Says Rav Huna, once you do it once, you violate the will of God once, and then you repeat it, you violate the will of God twice in the same area. It changes your perception of that thing. It becomes as if it is permitted. What he's telling us is, you do a mistake once, you violate the will of God once, you make a sin once, you transgress once. Once is an aberration. You do it twice, it changes your values. You treat the transgression differently. Now it becomes as if it is permitted. There's a difference 
between doing something once and doing something twice. When you do it once, we don't know necessarily that your relationship with this thing is now changed. You do it twice, it becomes as if it's permitted, it becomes something whose severity, whose harshness is now compromised. I can assume, I think we could all assume, that this is a general principle that we can expand elsewhere. What happens when you do a missile once? You do it once. It's great. But perhaps it's an aberration. When you do it twice, then there is a different relationship that you have now with the thing that you did twice. Now, perhaps the theory is that you do something once, everyone likes the experiment, there is novelty, you get enchanted. You can remain the same person, but you were just curious. You wanted a new experience, either good or bad, but you remain the same. You wanted an experiment, you tried something new, you did it once. But when you choose to experiment a second time, that's not an experiment anymore. That means that you have now made a decision that this is the thing that you want to do. So that's the analogy that I want to use, the framework I want to use to understand what's happening over here in the Exodus 2.0. Perhaps we can expand this idea to the broader question of change. Perhaps change is only possible when it happens twice. When the life-changing event, deed, behavior, choice, when it happens, not once, but it happens twice. The first time, well, that's almost like an inspiration. But that can be an aberration. When you do it a second time, that makes, that inspiration, it makes it stick. Even after there's a life-changing choice, and even if you would assume that now there's permanent change, but the prior identity lingers a little bit longer than anyone anticipates. So suppose you're an Egyptian. You're an Egyptian. Your family has lived in Egypt for more than 200 years. That's much longer than most of our families have been in our respective countries. Do you feel like an Egyptian? You behave like an Egyptian. You're a patriotic Egyptian. Yeah, maybe you know that you have some ancient pedigree. You came from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Sure, but so what? That's not who you are. And then you're in Egypt and you witness 10 nature-defying miracles and you were convinced. You choose to leave. You make a life-changing choice. I'm out of here. I'm going back to where I truly come from. I'm going back to the land where Abraham lived, the land flowing with milk and honey, I'm in, I sign up, I'm committed to the cause, I am part of this Abrahamic destiny and legacy. You make a choice to leave. You're part of the 20%. Nevertheless, we're not sure that you are in fact a different person. The change that you made can be perhaps superficial. It's skin deep. As soon as something upsets the apple cart, as soon as you go to the land of the Philistines, you see some conflict, you see some adversity, the reversion to the mean happens very fast. But you left! You walked away! So what? That happened once. Maybe that was some weird phase that you went through, it was an added character decision, it was an anomaly. Doing something once doesn't create permanent change. But when you do something twice, that indicates a real change and the adoption of a new identity. After the first exodus, there was still a concern that the Jews still identified as Egyptians and they would run home to the assumed safety and comfort of what they're familiar with when they encounter some 
adversity. The change was not quite permanent. To make the change real and permanent and unshakable, God manipulates the events. He chose to run it back, to do it all again. To repeat the Exodus experience, 10 more miracles, 10 more plagues. When the Exodus was done a second time, it ensured that the Jews will permanently be severed from their Egyptian identities. In fact, that's actually the stated goal of the splitting of the sea and the concomitant miracles. Chapter 14, verse 13. Moshe tells the nation, don't be steered. Stand up and watch and witness the salvation of God that he's going to do for you today. Because the way you see Egypt today, you're never going to see them like this again forever. We are now permanently treating the problem, the condition that you had. We're getting rid of this nemesis forever. In last week's parsha, the Jews left Egypt. But the change was not quite complete. And permanent. There was a great risk that the Jews would reverse course and revert back to being patriotic Egyptians. Perhaps we can say that some elements of affiliation, of allegiance to Egypt still lingered within them. You took the Jews out of Egypt, but you didn't quite take all of Egypt out of the Jews. And there was a need for Exodus, the sequel, to permanently purge any remnants of Egyptian affiliation from within them. The Exodus, the first one, that was a choice to leave and become part of this fledgling, nascent nation, trusting God, Moshe at its helm. But that was still an experiment. We cannot be certain quite yet that it is in fact a new people with a new identity who have walked away completely from who they were previously. Now, in Exodus, the sequel, you're never going to see Egypt again. You are a new person. Perhaps we can even speculate. That's why the Torah emphasizes that Moshe took the bones of Joseph. In Hebrew, the word for bones and the word for essence is the same word. Just like we say, you you feel something in your bones, it's in your essence. Joseph was someone who had tenacious faith in God in his bones. It wasn't skin deep. It was so deep-rooted that decades of distance from his family in the cesspool of Egypt could not shake Joseph off his game. Our Parsha is all about emulating Joseph. Not just Joseph, Joseph's bones. To take what you accomplished in last week's Parsha, in the first version of the Exodus, and moving it to your bones. And indeed, it happened. With the wiping out of Egypt at the sea, the nation erupted into song. What's happening over here? There was a spontaneous eruption of song, and that is a window into the emotional and psychological state of the Jewish people. When they left Egypt, there were ten amazing miracles, but the nation did not erupt in song in Exodus version 1. On their emotional level, in their psyche, in their bones, there was still some lingering force of servitude to the Egyptians. The idea of screaming in emotional ecstasy, that was not quite feasible yet. And now that they ran it back, and they had the second exodus, the faith and the transformation and the new identity had penetrated their bones. And they broke out into spontaneous song. According to this idea, whenever you have one momentous accomplishment, transformation, change, experience, 
if you want it to not be a passing phase, you have to do it again. You have to run it back. You have to retrace that accomplishment to secure the bag, to make it stick. After one choice, part of 20% after all, to completely alter your identity and to leave Egypt behind, right away we're worried about recidivism. They're going to run back to safety once they see a little bit of conflict. And God makes a second exodus to make the choice to leave and to adopt a new identity to make that permanent. You want to do something well? You want to accomplish something permanently? You want something to stick? You want something to last? You do it once. That's great. But it can be an aberration. You have to do it twice. And then it sticks. And this pattern appears all over Jewish life. With the festivals, like Passover with two days of the festival. You start off and you have the experience once. And then you do it again. Once to absorb the lessons. And once to solidify it permanently. Our status tell us that we wear two pairs of tefillin, or two tefillins, one on our head and one on the heart, for this reason as well. One to absorb the idea, and one to make it real, and to bring it to our heart, and to bring it internally in a way that it is unshakable. The Exodus, version 1, last week, was akin to the tefillin on the head. They had almost like logically in their in their conscious mind divested themselves of the Egyptians. They're part of the twenty percent. We're leaving, but their heart was not quite ready for song. It wasn't in their bones yet. There was still a little bit that needed to be scraped away, a little bit of the Egyptian influence. With Exodus two point oh, with the splitting of the sea, that etched the relationship with God. And their repudiation of Egypt into their hearts, like the tefillin on the arm that goes opposite the heart. And with their hearts so full of love, they began to sing. And this is the story of our parsha. It's Exodus the sequel. Because here, a sequel is, in fact, needed. There was something still left over to accomplish after last week's parsha and Exodus 1.0. And you can think of any change, the first time you do it, think of it as a coupon that can be redeemed for permanent change, provided that it's done again. When you do something once, you have an opportunity to earn that forever, provided that you reinforce what you did, you concretize what you did by doing it again. But this opportunity doesn't last forever. The coupon expires fast. In last week's part, we read about the matzah. We read about how you have to guard it so it doesn't become leavened. It doesn't become chametz. After you have the dough, you have to bake it promptly or else the opportunity to make matzah goes away. Once you have the dough, you have a very short window to make it into kosher matzah. You have to race to make sure that you do a second thing to it, you bake it, and you cement it as matzah forever. And our sages, quoted by Rashi, Lassi's Parsha, chapter 12, verse 17, they tell us that this is not just with matzos, it's also with mitzvos. If you are inspired, if you have made some sort of decision, you have something that you did already once, don't allow it to become chametz. You have an opportunity to make it last forever. Don't let it go stale, go bad. Don't let the coupon expire. If you want to do something good, you have to hurry to bake it because fire is going to chase you down if you allow it to linger. There are alloys. There are contaminants that are not getting gotten rid of the first time, you do it once, you do it again, and now you have it forever. Provided, of course, you don't lose it. And when we look at this parasha, we see this idea again and again. 
They get to Mara, and the waters are bitter. And Moshe throws the stick in it, and the waters are sweetened. That's the first miracle of water in our Parsha. They get to refeed him at the end of the Parsha, and again there's no water. And this time the stone is struck, and the stone emits water. And now we have a permanent well that's going to follow the Jewish people until the death of Miriam in about 40 years. So again, it seems like it's a repetition. You know, we have twice a situation, a dire situation where there's no water. And we have two miracles. The first one is not permanent, and the second one is permanent. Same idea. You do something once, it's great, it's not permanent. You do it twice, and now you have something that's permanent. Reversion to the mean is the rule. If you want to secure the bad, if you want to earn something in a permanent fashion, you got to cement it. You got to concretize it. You got to make it stick. You got to make it descend into your bones. Got to do it twice. So we have this amazing idea. If you want to have real change, you got to do it twice. And this works both on the positive and on the negative. If you want to extricate yourself from Egypt, you want to exorcise those demons, you have to have the exodus twice. And just like we brought down from the Talmud book of Revolution, page 40A in the bottom, you do a sin twice, now it's changed you forever. So it's interesting in our parsha, we have a similar idea, or at least the perhaps the hint of an idea on the flip side as well. The parsha ends with the war with Amalek. And it's interesting, Moshe tells Joshua, go select for you, for us, men, warriors, and go make war with Amalek tomorrow. And there's almost an astonishing thing here. The nation's ambushed, there's a surprise attack, and the counterattack is going to wait until tomorrow. So the commentaries explain that the battle with Amalek is a spiritual battle as well as a physical battle, and the way to win over the enemy is to delay until tomorrow. Just like we have this idea, you do a good thing once, you have a coupon that's swiftly expiring to be able to use it to do it again and to earn it permanently. Similarly, on the flip side, you have an attack against you, you have an incursion by the enemy, there is a risk if you do it twice, if you reinforce that sin twice, maybe that will permanently change you. So what does Moshe tell Joshua to do? Go wait until tomorrow. Delay until tomorrow. Allow the enemy to weaken. You don't have to encounter it again today. Perhaps we can even say that there's like a two-sided conflict with Amalek, and the whole battle's about tomorrow. You want to delay them until tomorrow when they win. Amalek wins. You're worried that you're going to have permanent change if you do it twice. Wait until tomorrow. Let the force, so to speak, of the negative coupon expire. And they want you to delay until tomorrow. They want you to procrastinate, to lose the momentum. Do the exodus once. Great. Don't do it twice. Have the miracle of the water once. Don't do it twice. Do the mitzvah once but allow the inspiration to expire. Wait until tomorrow. That is what they want. I think this is an amazing idea. A new framework for change. There is like a two-tiered system. You have to start off by getting something into your world, into your environment, and that is the first time you do it. And then you have to reinforce it and make it yours, earn it as a permanent change. Doing something once is very nice. It's very nice. Every good thing is encouraged and it is beautiful. But it's not permanent change. You chose to leave Egypt. There is a very real chance that absent a second exodus, you're going to revert back. The first change is also a steadily dissipating opportunity to earn that permanent change. And therefore, right away, you have to... We left, and now it's time to come back for a second exodus, for 10 more miracles, for 10 more plagues, to finally eliminate this villain. You do something once, it's still considered like dough. You have to bake it 
in order to make sure that it becomes matzah, and it permanently changes to make something that resonates in your bones, that makes you sing, that changes you forever, got to do it twice. Okay, let's get this week's exquisite insight. This is courtesy of Rabbeinu Bechaya at the end of the parsha. Moshe tells Yahushua, tells Joshua, go select for us men. What is this selection process for the war against Amalek? So Rabbeinu Bechaya says something really interesting. The first time I saw it was this year. Listen to this. Amalek, they were a nation, or they are a nation, that had tremendous insight into the wisdom of clairvoyance, of forecasting by looking into the stars, just like Pharaoh did, looking into the stars and knowing the future. And the people that they chose for war were selected based upon the destiny of those people. They only selected people who the stars foretold will definitely live out the year. They were able to look in the stars and find the destiny of their soldiers and anyone that there was even a chance that they could die that year, they weren't admitted to the fighting force. And that's why they were almost like an indestructible enemy because all the people were were guaranteed to live throughout the year. And therefore, says Rabbeinu B'chaya, Moshe said to Joshua, go select for us men. Do the same thing. They could do it. We can do it too. You go look into the stars and go find the men that are guaranteed to survive the year. Find people that are equally indestructible and therefore, at least if we can't defeat the enemy, we will survive. And that's why the verse says that Joshua weakened the enemy, but it doesn't say that Joshua eliminated or killed the enemy. So first of all, there's an interesting idea that Rabbeinu B'chai here tells us, but I think there's also a very valuable, exquisite insight here. Amalek is representative of the force that we're trying to defeat, the force that we're trying to overcome, the Yitzhahara. What do you do when you cannot defeat the enemy? You can't eliminate the enemy. The enemy is indestructible. What is the response to that? How do you contend with an enemy that you cannot overcome, no matter how hard you try? How hard you try, it doesn't matter. It is declared in the heavens and the stars that they are going to survive. What you do is you make yourself indestructible, indomitable as well. If you're not going to win, cover your downside. Don't lose. Don't expire. Outlast them. I was thinking, this is not the first war that we had with Amalek. Jacob, in that nocturnal struggle in Parshas Vayishlach, he goes back to get the small judge. He's alone and he's attacked by the angel. What did he do in the first war with Amalek? He couldn't defeat the angel, but he made sure that the angel wouldn't defeat him as well. It's not your job to defeat the enemy. Stay alive. Stay in the struggle. Don't expire. And that is the way to deal with enemies that we cannot eliminate. I think it's a very valuable framework. It's an exquisite insight. I hope you enjoyed. Thank you so much for listening to this week's partnership podcast from the Torch Center in Houston, Texas. I hope you have a fabulous rest of your day, a splendid rest of your week, and an incredible, sensational, terrific, wonderful, and spectacular Shabbos upcoming. I'm pleased to have the help of the Almighty. We'll talk again next week. My email address is rabbiwalby at gmail.com.